let's see, I was drafted in the 68, I went to Vietnam in 69, 70. I was in a unit, uh, uh, 1st Air Cavalry Division, uh, the 5th Battalion of the 7th Cavalry. That's uh, Colonel Custer's brigade, by the way. And I was in Charlie Company, 1st uh, Platoon, 1st Squad, B Fire Team, Rifleman. And uh, 30 combat assaults from a helicopter, wounded twice. And there were a couple of interesting stories. I think the uh, uh, first one would be everybody has to walk point. And when I was walking point, I had a new guy uh, behind me. And uh, one of the jobs is uh, search and destroy. We're looking for Charlie's home, uh, bunker complexes. And we came across this hole in the ground. <clears throat> and it was an unusual hole because it looked like a cookie cutter made it. And uh, we crawled up to it, and I couldn't see in it, and uh, the guy behind me wanted to frag it. And I said, wait a minute, let's take a look down here and make sure what we're dealing with. And I asked for a flashlight, and it got passed up. And we looked down, and sure enough, we see the tail fin of a 2,000-pound bomb that hadn't gone off. And of course, if we had thrown a grenade down there, the whole company would have been wiped out. And I think another interesting story is uh, we had just made a combat assault, and 3rd Platoon had the wood line. And when we came down, they had movement and they uh, wanted to be reinforced. So they asked our platoon to send one squad over to back them up. And it was a very large area. And uh, we were afraid Charlie was monitoring the radios because we used standard FM radio. So to signal uh, back, we wanted to use a smoke grenade. And the sergeant told me it was my turn to use the smoke grenade. Well, my smoke grenade was on the bottom of my pack. So I had to stop and unload my pack, give him the smoke grenade, and put my pack back in. And it's taking so long, the sergeant's ready to shoot me. Everybody's looking at me and waiting. And uh, meanwhile, the 3rd platoon was getting so nervous that uh, they decided to call in air support. They felt they, they were going to be overrun. So they... We always have two Cobras overhead for backup until the assault's complete. And uh, they decided on red smoke in front of them to be the signal for where the rockets should go. And uh, unbeknownst to them, at the exact same time, the colonel decided to land. And of course, they threw a red smoke for the colonel right behind him to land his ship. And the Cobra saw the wrong red smoke and uh, emptied uh, about a dozen rockets into the 3rd platoon, killing and wounding most of them. And of course I had put my pack back together and we had just started off to reinforce them. And we saw everything happen in front of us. We couldn't believe what we just saw. And uh, about, the same <laughs> about the same time everybody turned to me and realized <laughs> if I had that smoke grenade on my belt instead of the bottom of my pack, we would have been over there with, in the middle of it all. It's one of those very close calls. And then um, I remember my first my first day in country. Uh, we were at Quan uh, Loy, uh, Forward LZ, and I was given the position uh, to use a 50 caliber machine gun on the wire. And uh, we were attacked. And I'm shooting the gun, and I used up all the ammunition. I bend over to get some more uh, ammo, and there was a brand new kid next to me, and he immediately starts yelling, "He's been hit! He's been hit!" <laughs> you know, and he keeps grabbing me, and I'm trying to get the ammunition. And I'm saying, "Let go! I'm all right." And I just want to reload the gun. And finally, a guy—it turned out he was in the Green Beret. He came over and he calmed this guy down so I could reload the gun. And then he told me something interesting. He says, "Every shot you've shot is missed. You're shooting too high." And he showed me how to use the gun properly. And, uh, <laughs> definitely an eye-opening experience. <laughs> there were a lot of good experiences over there. Like there was a hill we had a guard for a week that had uh, radio transmitters on the top near uh, Quan Loi. It was called Song Bay, a very famous uh, radio transmitter relay station. And uh, there, the monsoon season, you had rain clouds that would clear up in the morning. And you could watch a sunset under there, uh, under the clouds, before they, this little area uh, between the earth and, and the clouds, and it was just magnificent. It was the most beautiful thing I ever saw. It was unbelievable. Another uh, enjoyable thing was uh, we were 
going through the jungle and we hit a bamboo forest. And in the center of the bamboo forest was old growth bamboo. And the old growth would fall over on itself, creating these natural arches. And they would go on forever, as far as you can see, because it took us three days to go through this forest. And uh, what made it beautiful was uh, the trees on the top had brand new leaves that had these light green color that the sun would go through. And on the floor were the dead leaves, a golden yellow, which would reflect this warm glow. And, and then the arches, were just magnificent, it was very special, very beautiful. But there was one thing to give you a cold chill. That night we, uh, we always dig foxholes uh, at night before we go to bed. And we're digging our foxholes and we start to hit junk and clutter. And we find a, an old helmet and it turned out to be a Japanese helmet from World War II. And it seems like everything was just repeating itself all over again. Some kind of omen, I guess. Was it the way that they fought that seemed very much like the Japanese used to fight? or No, it's just the fact that there was endless war there for 50 years. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to stop. It doesn't matter what country, what religion, what, what government. There's always something being contested there. It's kind of sad. What were the people like? Everybody I met was very warm and nice, which is, uh, makes it even harder to think that uh, these people lost their country to the communists and we weren't able to fully support them uh, any further because of, uh, of uh, the negative uh, reporting on what we were trying to do. We were trying to stop communism and all of a sudden that didn't seem to matter anymore. Uh, but everyone I met I liked. I had no problem with anybody I met. Um. You, now, you were involved in a helicopter crash of some sort, weren't you? Yeah, we were shot down in one, and we crashed uh, while making an assault with another one. We were coming down in a very small area. Three ships were coming down at once, and one got too close to the trees. And as soon as the blades hit the tree, the ship started to go around, and we came down at a side. And uh, I was the guy with the feet hanging out, so when the ship went like this, I got thrown out. But the motor came in on the rest of them, so I was pretty lucky. I survived that. I survived both of them. We were cutting trail, we came through this bamboo thicket and we saw a trail in the ground and the unique thing about the trail was uh, it was heavily worn and it was deep because Charlie goes one at a time and uh, you could tell someone had just gone by. We didn't surprise anybody but we had a West Point captain who thought he knew his stuff and he had our whole company deploy along this line and we were going to ambush Charlie, sure. Uh, that night he ambushed us by walking mortars through us all night long. <laughs> uh, that one night, we usually dig uh, foxholes for everybody, but supposedly we were, we were supposed to leave maybe in the night, and we weren't sure whether we were going to leave that night or not. And so uh, most of us didn't dig a hole, and that's why we had a lot of wounded. We thought we were going to pull out, and we didn't. We were afraid we were going to leave holes for Charlie to use. So. Uh, it's one of those calculated risks and uh, didn't work out in our favor. Well, there was a river crossing we made where everybody with an M79 grenade launcher used it to pound the other side of the uh, bank before we crossed the river so we wouldn't get hit. And we thought we did a pretty good job. We made the crossing in force and we came up. There was a bunker complex there, but it was totally deserted. And by the way, we missed. Every shot was short. <laughs> So, if Charlie was there, he could have made a big mess of it. What, yeah, what was it about Agent Orange that happened? Didn't you get oh, hit by... Well, they used it as a defoliant, so Charlie couldn't hide in the jungles, the part of the jungles we weren't using, and that the farmers weren't using to uh, uh, use for crops. Uh, we went through a lot of areas like that. That's how I got it. So, uh, a lot of guys got it. No one was really worried about it. At the time, we didn't know there was any problem. We didn't even think about it. It was like using uh, uh, an insecticide or shaving lotion. You just thought it was some chemical that you could use and it was no big deal. I never heard that it was, uh, using Agent Orange, uh, I never heard that it was a secret. Uh, we were openly told uh, that uh, it was being used here or there. No one was afraid of it. We didn't realize there was a problem. Uh, of course, until it was too late. Uh, but uh, I didn't. I wasn't aware of any conspiracy. There was afterwards to uh, admit there was uh, any harm done by it. Uh, luckily there was a young man who had the financial resources to fight for over 30 years and he won the case 
and uh, all the people who had uh, uh, filed claims got back settlements thanks to him because he could uh, stay the fight that long. Most people can't, don't have the resources to sue for 30 some years. Where do you think you might have been exposed to it? Oh, I don't think I could tell you because uh, it's always moist. <clears throat> if it, it rained there just about every day, so you could get run off on you with a chemical in it very easily. <clears throat> so there's dozens of ways you could get it. Well, the first thing that hits you is the humidity. Uh, first, it's hard to breathe, uh, all the moisture in the air. And going to bed wet every night was a pain in the butt. But uh, there is one funny antidote. <clears throat> you can always tell where the American Army was. In the evening, you could listen to them filling up their air mattresses. <sighs> Hundreds of guys blowing air into an air mattress. So is that how they would figure out where you were? Oh, I don't really know if that's true. It just I remember that being something that was always in the back of my mind. Surely they can hear us doing this, you know, if they're close enough. Well, the only way you could get uh, a replace, replacement clothing is uh, when you'd come in from your 28 days of uh, being out in the sticks. And uh, after that, <laughs> from sweating and all the... Uh, other things that accumulate in the cloth. You could take off your shirt and just about set it down and it would hold up itself. One mission we had, uh, we worked with the Arvins, which is the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, and uh, to make sure we didn't shoot any of them, they stayed on one side of the river and we stayed on the other. And it worked out pretty good. It was the longest battle we ever had. It was six days. Usually when we have a conflict, it lasts minutes. Uh, Ten minutes is a long battle. It's very quick. They empty a clip and they run. So it's not a long thing like you see in the movies with the, with the uh, uh, Germans. It's just a different war. It's a different animal. Hit and run. And they usually fire the first shot. They surprise us because it's their backyard and they know it. Yeah. Um, yeah, what was that six-day battle like? What would happen there? <clears throat> well, that didn't go well. We normally go on a column. Um, somebody in our column got confused and straggled off in another direction, leading the whole column behind him to create a second column, which started to parallel our column, which we didn't know was not ours, and we opened fire on him and got casualties. And uh, it was a very sad thing. Well, we were trying to flush out uh, Viet Cong to get them out of the area. They were harassing the farmers. They were killing villagers if they didn't join their ranks. And um, But it was always different when you went out. It was never the same. I think uh, the monsoon was the worst thing, going to bed wet every night for four to six months. Well, one of the interesting things uh, about being out in the field is you got to eat uh, a ration called Lerps, which was uh, little food packets that were dehydrated food. And wh what you did was you'd take your canteen cup and dig a little hole in the ground, put two sticks over the hole so your cup doesn't fall in, and then you had this uh, light powder blue uh, tablet, and you break a piece off and put it in the hole and that was your fuel that burned. And what was unique about this fuel was uh, it was almost flameless, you, you, almost impossible to see a flame. It was unbelievable. So it was very safe. You didn't have to worry about Charlie seeing it. And it would boil your water really quick, and then, of course, you could put your dehydrated food in there and mix. Uh, you pour that in the packet and mix it up. And Usually, uh, most of their dinners were very good. I remember if you had a chicken and rice, you could trade it for anything you wanted. <laughs> <clears throat> um, another interesting thing they had is uh, super glue was invented during the Vietnam War and was used to by the medics to close uh, wounds so you didn't bleed to death so they could get you to a real hospital, field hospital, and give you some serious help. No one had to go through a, a superhero acting type event. Yeah. Um, I remember one time we were breaking trail <clears throat> and we found an old trail, very old trail. And we usually don't 
do this. We don't follow the trails because we get in trouble if we do that because Charlie hears us coming and all they do is set up things and then we hit it. So what we did, uh, we, we had this uh, new officer and he wanted us to go down this trail and uh, we reluctantly <laughs> did it and uh, curiosity was we uh, went about a quarter of a mile and all of a sudden it got a little wide and there was this long table a lot of tables put together and they had a tablecloth and there was settings and everything you could imagine a normal dinner table would have including food. It was just incredible. It's like we just interrupted a very important Big Wigs dinner and uh, <laughs> I don't know who was there but it was important and here was all this, it was like a fantasy this all this stuff in the middle of the jungle you know, silverware, everything no people. No people. They heard us coming, so they ran out real quick. See, they know we don't usually follow trails, so we probably start startled them as much as <laughs> finding that startled us. Wow. Yeah, it was really bizarre. The only other story I could think of is we were checking bunker, the bunker complex, and uh, I was the only guy in the unit that ever set off a booby trap. Uh, what happened was I walked through the door. I didn't see this wire on the bottom with a an old sea ration can with a grenade in it but luckily because of the rain the last few days the grenade had rusted to the can and couldn't go off couldn't pop out and go off so I was, <laughs> I was just dumb luck because I didn't even see it I was so nervous about going through the door and running into someone I didn't look down <laughs> did somebody else have to point it out to you no I felt it go off I, you know I felt the wire break oh did you think you were dead at that moment oh uh, yeah <laughs> Man, you look down and it's like, oh man, lucky guy. Yeah, yeah, so the angels were watching over me there. Wow. Man, how long were you there? I was there uh, 14 months, and that's because if you're drafted, which I was, and you extend in a combat zone for two months, you get a five-month early out, which is what I wanted to do. Because I didn't feel the Army was a career move for me. <laughs>